Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today uh, with hearts that are hurting, with memories that uh, just uh, resonate in our minds as we miss uh, a dear friend, a father, a husband. Lord, I just pray that the peace that passes all understanding will fill each heart here today and that we will cling to the cross of Christ and the empty tomb outside of Jerusalem, knowing that one day soon we will be together again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I first became acquainted with the Chesney family, family back in the late, mid to late 50s, I suppose it was, somewhere along in there when we were in church here at Bowman Hills together. And I think at that time, Evan, you were the only one on the scene. You were a very, very small little boy at that time. But, but uh, anyway, we had, had the opportunity to get to know the, the Chesney family back then and uh, our families became friends and have enjoyed warm relationship ever since. Um, Richard was born March 4, 1931 in Greenville, Tennessee at the Adventist Hospital there to Daryl and Florence Chesney. When he and his mother were released from the hospital, they returned to Knoxville where Richard grew up. He attended church school there as a child and then young high school graduating in 1948. He attended Southern Missionary College, now known as Southern Adventist University, and graduated from Southern in 1953 with a BA degree in chemistry. One year, he took an elective course in printing, including hands-on training at the college press. This introduction to the printing profession helped Richard make a lifelong decision to make that his life work. During Richard's senior year, Uncle Sam came a-calling. So after graduating, he was inducted into the U.S. Army with a promise from the college press that there would be a job waiting for him following his years in military service. Because of his degree in chemistry, he was asked to serve as a lab technician after basic training at Fort Jackson. He served in that capacity at the Atlanta Depot and in San Antonio, Texas. The Korean War ended at that time, so he did not have to go overseas. Richard returned to College Dell to work at the College Press until Wynton Preston brought him to Cleveland to work at his company. Richard enjoyed a long career in the printing industry, first with Preston Printing Company for 33 years, followed by 15 years at Starkey Printing in Chattanooga, before retiring at the age of 75. Pretty good track record, huh? During those years, he served as a com compositor, a linotype operator, and for many years as an estimator. He enjoyed working on his cars beginning with a 1955 Chevy that he bought new right after leaving the Army with the money he had saved during that time. That car was followed by a 1957 Chevy that he wished he had kept. And I can say amen to that. Another early interest developed in college was playing the ukulele with a group of guys who lived in the part of the dorm they nicknamed Rebel Roost. His good buddy Joel Tompkins got a kick out of telling stories about the antics they all had. Incidentally, Elder Tompkins was the one who introduced Daryl and Richard to each other in 1998. Richard enjoyed watching the Atlanta Braves games on television and not having them play this season because of the coronavirus was a disappointment to him while he was confined to his house. In years past, he was a member of the Chattanooga Area Model Railroad Club and also did a lot of camping with his young family in the Smokies as well as working with the Old Wall College Hill Pathfinder Club. Richard was married to Ruby Reed from 1957 until her death in 1993. They had three children, Evan, Sharon, and Dwayne. Even Evan and Dwayne were both music majors at Southern. Evan went on to earn further music degrees and worked in that field for many years. And I'll just insert here that that was the, probably the first time I took note of the Chesney family was when Evan was standing on a chair on this platform singing for church. I think you were three years old or something like that. Four? Okay. A year or two. Doesn't matter, yeah. Okay. Um, 
he, Evan, lives in Popka, Florida. Sharon works in the office administration in Atlanta and is married to Chuck Jenkins, and Dwayne lives in Ultawa and is married to Nancy. Richard and Daryl were married in 1999 at the Ultawa Church by Pastor Dwight Hare, that's me. I had the privilege of watching their courtship and meeting with them for a number of weeks as we did premarital counseling together. They were very compatible and enjoyed so many activities together. And at this time, Daryl was teaching piano at the church school there, as well as acting music director of Silverdale, Silverdale Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Daryl continued teaching piano until her retirement this past year. She has two children from a previous marriage, Douglas Mayberry and Doreen Frost. Doreen has two children, Brandon and Brett Frost. Richard passed away peacefully at home on the morning of Friday, May 22, 2020, after a brief illness. He was 89 years old. The family is grateful to Eagle Home Care and, and Adoration Hospice for the loving care they provided. His, his faith sustained him through it all, and he died with that wonderful assurance of Christ's return and an eternal life with God's kingdom. And I look forward to that day. I always look forward to Sabbath seeing Richard because he always had that smile on his face and was always had a warm, cordial greeting. And I look forward to that day in the kingdom when he'll smile at me again, put out his hand or wrap his arms around me, give me a hug and tell me good morning, happy Sabbath or whatever he's gonna to say to me. May Jesus come soon and bring us all back together.
It was August of 1945. That's a couple of months away from being 75 years that I've known Richard Chesney. <clears throat> Neither one of us had ever been to junior camp before and we never went another time, but uh, we, did, we went there in August of 1945. We rode the conference truck, which was then an open, open top with a canvas, and they didn't use a canvas as nice weather, so bunches of us rode on the back of the truck. Now, they wouldn't allow us to do that now. The EOC wouldn't allow that at all, but that's what we did in 1945. We rode from Atlanta down to Chipley, Georgia, which is now known as Pine Mountain, to Pine Mountain um, State Park, where they had conducted junior camp for many years before they built one up in North Georgia. Well, Richard and I were assigned to the same unit. We were in different rooms, but I was in there with three Atlanta guys, and Richard was in there four, with four Knoxville guy, guys. And I had never, I lived 70 miles from the Atlanta church, so I had not attended church. I'd only been to the Adventist church three or four times in my life, but my mother was a great teacher, and so we conducted our church service right in our living room, the dining room. Well, Richard and I got acquainted there, and uh, he told me many years later that Elder Hillard, our, our um, counselor, said, you be kind to Arnold because he's, he's hadn't been to an Adventist church. And so that's true. <laughs> I hadn't, but, but they were real kind to me, and I'd never been around anybody much, and so it was an enjoyable situation. Now, Many, many years later, well, not too many years later, we wound up at Southern Missionary College. Uh, Georgia only had 11 grades then, so I graduated a year ahead of Richard, even though he's only three months older than me. Uh, I wish I'd had 12 years of training because I was way behind everybody else scholastically. But anyway, Richard and I renewed our friendship, which has continued all through the years. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things Richard in, uh, did at College Dale was he played the ukulele. And so <laughs> we, we enjoyed his, his music, we really did. And years later when Mary and I put on programs here at Bowman Hills, well, Richard, we had him play the ukulele again. We put on several Western programs and he was always willing to help. And after, um, okay, we both went in the Army. I was, went in several years ahead of him, but he wound up in, in Atlanta, Fort McClellan, I guess it was, but not McClellan, but McPherson. But um, anyway, that's, that's where he met Ruby. And so wound up, I, I, I got out of the Army, I moved to, to Chattanooga, Knoxville, Columbus, Georgia, and, and back to, Chattanooga and here in Bowman Hills. So we renewed our friendship again right here in, in this church. And after Ruby died, uh, Mary was on a, on a trip somewhere out of, out of the U.S. And so I invited Richard to go down to take a trip with me down to uh, Lookout Mountain, Georgia to go to church. And we went down there. We was hoping we'd see Desmond Doss. Not only did we see Desmond Doss, but Desmond and his wife invited us home for lunch. <laughs> so we, we had a good time there with, with, um, with the, the Dosses. Um, I want to back up something here, and um, I'm not going to embarrass Daryl, but uh, in college, a lot of us had nicknames. <laughs> And mine was Appalachia because I was from Appalachia, Georgia, and they still call me that. Well, Dan Doherty had a bunch of motorcycle wrecks, and they called him Dangerous Dan. Well, Lois Doherty never did like that, and Daryl didn't like Richard's nickname. And I'm not going to say what it is because I'm going to... Because... 
Uh, I've always called him Richard ever since you told me you didn't like that, so I, I respect you. <laughs> but he, he had this nickname. He, he'd, he'd say, my name's Richard, but people call me... <laughs> 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 so, uh, um, one thing, uh, Richard went to the church school there in Knoxville, was in the basement of Knoxville Church, and so uh, one of his teachers some years later told me that um, Richard was really a good student, but he had one, did one thing that annoyed her a lot. He never did cause any trouble, but the rest of the worse and boys was always causing trouble, and all Richard would do was giggle. <laughs> he didn't participate in it, but he sure did enjoy what the others were doing. <laughs> um, well, uh, here Daryl came along, and after Richard being a, a single guy for many years, and I could see he, he really brightened up. He really enjoyed Daryl. <laughs> so she was a blessing to Richard. And of course, I've lost two wives, and I know after Mary died, uh, uh, I'd, I, was, I really appreciated people being kind to me, and I had a really nice year, uh, nine year second marriage to a sweet lady. And, but I know what it is to be lonesome. And I'm lonesome again. And the thing I miss so much is sitting in church by myself because it was routine for me to hold hand to my lady during church service and especially during prayer. So Daryl really lightened up his life. And um, let's see. Well, that's, that's the main thing. Richard and I remain really good friends and so are the children. And so I'm just glad and so happy that I knew Richard and claimed him as my friend for 75 years this August. It is appropriate to hold this memorial service at the Bowman Hills Church. My parents built their house in Wilson Heights subdivision about the same time that this church was being built. They scavenged some of the gray stones that cover this church facade, and they used those stones to make a fireplace in our living room, a chimney on our roof, and big planters on the front side of our house. From a very early age, I knew where those stones came from. There was a physical connection between our house and this church. And those stones also represented a spiritual connection between our home and church life. My father was very proud of his house. It embodied much of his identity. And he got to go to sleep in his own bedroom in the house that he built and lived in for the majority of his life. I'm glad he got to do that. Richard Chesney was a decent man who loved his family. Let me say that again. Richard Chesney was a decent man who loved his family. He grew up in a little house in downtown Knoxville. His parents didn't have high profile jobs. They were pretty low key people living a routine life. But they had winning personalities and liked to have fun. They wanted to raise their only child to love Jesus and to make a positive difference in this world. And so they did. They were active in their church and so was my dad. He went to Southern Missionary College where he majored in chemistry. Chemistry suited him well for he was very smart, methodical, detail-oriented, careful. If I were to characterize my dad's temperament, 
I would liken him to a turtle. His parents were turtles. And so they raised a very smart and happy turtle. He worked at the college press to make money to help pay his tuition. There he earned a reputation for reliability, dependability, and excellence. He made lifelong friends in college. He was a fun guy who liked to be around other people who had fun. After college, my dad worked as a lab technician for the U.S. Army at a base near Atlanta. And that's where he met Ruby Reed, my mama, at church. Because my father believed it was important to be active in church, just as his parents had raised him. Now, I can understand why he was attracted to Ruby. She was beautiful and wore gorgeous clothes. She had a lovely smile and laughed a lot and liked to have fun. I would have been attracted to her too. Now my mother grew up in a very different kind of household. Her daddy was a city bus driver in Washington, D.C. She and her three older brothers were part of a family of dedicated, driven people who wouldn't let anything stand in their way. There was a lot of drama in the Reed household. And so my mama was a high drama woman. Everything was a big thing for her. If I were to characterize my mother's temperament, I would liken her to a squirrel, running around, waving its tail, and chattering all the time. And those of you who knew my parents when I was a little kid know exactly what I'm talking about. She was high drama. So, what's it like when a turtle marries a squirrel? Well, it's pretty interesting, I'll tell you. For one thing, you get a crazy guy like me. My parents were good for each other. My turtle father supplied peace and stability for his wife. My squirrel mother kept her turtle husband moving, lest he pull in his legs and his head and snap his shell shut. They were a tight team united in the way they wanted to run their household. My daddy determined that even though we wouldn't have a lot of money, he wanted his wife, <laughs> he wanted his wife to stay home and raise their children. And so, every morning, my father went off to Preston Printing Company at 7 o'clock and got off at 3.30. And then he came home. That routine brought stability to our family. No matter what kind of chaos might be happening in our house on any given day, I knew that when my father came home from work, things would get better. He would come through that back door, and whether my mama was happy or falling apart, he always took her into his arms, <laughs> told her how much he loved her, and gave her a big kiss on the mouth in front of us kids. Now, that was kind of gross, <laughs> but it was a wonderful example of unconditional love. My mama depended on him a lot, and he was there for her. And he was there for his kids. He played with his kids. He helped them do, with, do homework. He did chores with his kids. He built a tree house and a sandbox and a swing set. He would put us in the wheelbarrow and run us around the yard, bouncing and squealing in delight as we went. We had a lot of fun as a family. We went on picnics, camping trips, hiked on the trails that are all over this part of the country, and took car drives just to enjoy the beautiful scenery. My parents were determined to raise their children to love Jesus and to make a positive difference in this world. So they were active in church and made sure their children were too. When I was a little kid, we went to prayer meeting in that chapel over there, which I don't think is a chapel anymore. 
It was kind of like going to mini church in the middle of the week. I enjoyed singing the songs at prayer meeting. That was a lot of fun. The bad part of prayer meeting was the praying part, which lasted a long time. They did this kind of open mic praying thing where various people would pray and then there would be long silent periods where we wondered if anybody else would decide to pray and then two people would start to pray at the same time and one of them would have to stop. I was entertained by that little scenario. We also did camp meeting. When I was a little kid, camp meeting probably lasted 10 days or more. There were dozens of canvas tents with wooden floors neatly lined up on the slope of Southern Missionary College. And down on the flat place at the bottom of the hill, they erected huge campus tents for children and youth meetings. Fun stuff for kids. And every night there would be a big meeting in the tabernacle, this giant wooden building at the end of campus that had huge windows which opened to the outside because there was no AC and doorways all down the side of the building so people could easily enter and exit. There was always a dynamic leader who would direct us in congregational singing. Hundreds of people singing like there was no tomorrow made a huge noise. I just loved that. It was like a big revival. And everybody had one of those cardboard fans that were stapled to a big wooden tongue depressor. On those fans were pictures of Jesus and Jesus with the children and Jesus coming in the clouds of glory and Jesus coming out of the tomb. And all those fans created a constant fluttering motion that I thought was kind of fun. And we were there because my father thought it was important for us to go to camp meeting. Every year the Chesney drama moved from Cleveland into one of those tents in Collegedale. Every morning, my father would drive to work, and when his job was done, he joined us for whatever was left of camp meeting that day. My parents were active in Pathfinders to make sure their kids were part of that program. One of the main activities of Pathfinders was camping, and we went on a lot of campouts with a whole bunch of kids with their parents who would sit around the fire and socialize after all their kids had supposedly been put to bed in the tents. One year, we had a marvelous Pathfinder Halloween party in the basement of our house for about 60 kids who came in a big yellow bus. We had a grand old time playing scary games and eating Halloween-themed food. I think there was a hayride involved at some point. As a Pathfinder, I wanted to get a tree honor badge. So my dad took me on walks through the woods where he taught me how to identify trees. He helped me create a huge leaf collection display out of salvaged shipping crates from the print shop, which we stained and hinged together so they would all stand connected as three panels. That leaf collection was featured at the Collegedale Pathfinder Club booth at the infamous Southern Union Pathfinder Campery that was held in Collegedale. That particular Campery was infamous because somebody thought it would be a good idea to have a soapbox derby race as part of the festivities. A lot of Pathfinder clubs also thought that was a good idea, so each club created a little soapbox race car. And my father was part of that. For several weeks, we spent a lot of time at Pathfinder meetings building this soapbox car. It was red. But the thing was, you couldn't practice with it because you might mess it up and then it wouldn't be usable for the race. So that red soapbox derby race car took its maiden voyage the day of the race. I was chosen to drive the thing because I was the only kid small enough to fit in it. Pearson Drive was the chosen route for this race. Now, Pearson Drive is pretty steep, and it also has curves, which meant there was some steering to be done. Somebody also thought it would be a good idea to build a tall wooden ramp at the top of the hill so each of the racers would have an equal start, which meant we were going pretty fast before we even hit the pavement. 
As the driver, I was nervous because the reputation of our club was resting on my ability at the wheel. One club made their race car to look like a watermelon. And as I was zipping down Pearson Drive, rounding one of those critical curves, I went by a yard that had watermelon strewn all over it. <laughs> I think there was an, an ambulance involved. Some lady sitting on a lawn chair watching the race got hit by a watermelon. Our club came in third place. And my daddy was so proud, and that made me proud too. I don't think they ever did a soapbox derby race after that, but boy howdy did we have a good time. I made a lot of good Christian friends by being involved in youth activities at church because that was important to my father. My parents recognized the value of Christian education and so just as my dad and his dad before him did, I attended Southern Missionary College where I graduated with a music degree. And then my dad turned me loose. And I went off to build my own life as a young adult who loved Jesus and wanted to make a positive difference in the world. Now when our mama died in 1994, my father pulled in his legs and his head and that turtle shell snapped shut for about three years. But one day he stuck his head out and discovered internet dating. He struck up conversations with several women, alleged women. One night as he was visiting Jan and me in Florida, he brought out this file box. In that file box, he had arranged folders for each of the women he was talking to on the internet. He had printed out all of their exchanges and filed them, and then he commenced reading them all. I became alarmed as he read about how proud he was of his children. He was telling our names and where we lived and what we did for work, and I said, no, Dad, you cannot be giving out our personal information. For all you know, the lady on the other end of that exchange could be some 400-pound man sitting on his bed in the basement of a house in Russia. <laughs> so it was with great relief that I learned somebody had introduced my father to a real-life person in Collegedale. Her name was Daryl Mayberry. And they just latched on to each other and got married in 1999. I was glad she took him off the internet. Their marriage was a good thing for both of them. He supplied love, tenderness, and stability. She kept him moving. She brought happiness and enthusiasm and sociability to my dad's life. She drug him all over the place. And I knew it was good because he always had a smile on his face whenever I saw them. They were a team united in their love of Jesus and their desire to make a positive difference in this world. Many of you know more about their relationship than I do. But I can say that Daryl is one of the most kind and generous and dedicated people I know. I am really glad she is part of my family. I did not lose a dad. He finished his dad thing many years ago. It is Daryl who is experiencing the greatest loss today because she lost her husband, her companion, her lover. Daryl, I am so sorry for your loss. I want you to know that I am here for you. I've got your back. Now I want to say something about our neighbors who live across the street. Walter and Catherine Nunnally had three children. Walter had a job at the nearby paper mill. He and my father went off to work every day doing plain, ordinary jobs. But when they punched out at the end of their shifts, they were done. They walked away from their jobs, came home, 
and were fully present for their wives and children. You don't make a whole lot of money that way, but the investment in your family is well worth it. Like my parents, Walter and Catherine raised their children to love Jesus and to make a positive difference in this world. They were active in their church, and so were their children. Many times, one of the nunnally kids or in-laws has come over to help Dad and Daryl do things they couldn't handle by themselves, something I couldn't do because I live too far away. I'm grateful for that. Richard Chesney was a decent man who loved his families, both of them. Let me say that again. Richard Chesney was a decent man who loved his families, both of them. I don't know any better words that could be said about a person. And I'm here to say, I'm glad he was my dad. That rhymes. I don't know if I had my dad wrapped around my little finger or if he had me wrapped around his little finger. I think it was mutual, but in any case, I was definitely a daddy's girl. When I was little, I remember dad coming home from work on time every day, greeting my mom with a big hug and kiss. Then he would hug and kiss us. He'd go to the living room to sit down on the couch and read the newspaper or see what the new Sears and Roebuck catalog had. I managed to crawl up on his lap, and he didn't seem to mind. He never seemed to mind and would tell me what he was reading. I wanted to be a hairdresser like my Aunt Betty Chastain. So, as a little girl, on Sabbath afternoons, I'd take my shoes and socks off and stand up on the couch with my brush and comb and comb my dad's hair. And he didn't care. He was happy for me to do it. Now, you all know my dad very well, and he had a, a good, pretty strip of hair right here in the middle that he would comb over. So I'd comb it down, and then I'd brush it over like he would do. And one Sabbath afternoon, I got to thinking, that strip of hair in the middle of his head needs to be curled. So I took my comb and twisted his hair in my comb, but then when I went to take it out, it got stuck. My poor mama thought she was going to have to cut his hair off. She was a wreck. However, we were able to get it untangled, and Dad was able to keep that bit of hair for a while longer. Dad also had a game he would play with us, which all three of us loved, and some of you who are us kids' ages, when you were our, when we were little, may have had this same experience with my dad. He would do the horsey ride, and we would face him, and he'd hold our hands, and then he'd say, "This is the way the lady rides," and his knees would go up and down like this, and then, "This is the way the gentleman rides." The gentleman rides, and then came the fun part. This is the way the cowboy rides, the cowboy rides, the cowboy rides. We loved that. My dad loved to play games with us, and I just cherish those memories from being a small child. What an exciting day it was when dad got his first John Deere lawnmower. He and mom used to push a lawnmower 
to mow two and a half acres of land for years. Now we had made it big time. Us kids wanted to ride it too, so dad would take us each one on a ride around a couple of times in the yard as he was mowing. Once Evan and I were old enough to mow, dad would mow a couple of rounds so we would know how, what path to follow, and then he would take that push mower and do the weed eating, because at that time there was no weed eating, weed eater. I don't remember too much about dad talking about his army days. However, we loved his army blankets. We made a tent out of them, and the one covering our heads had two holes in it, and we would stick our heads out to see what was going on around us in the yard. That was so much fun, and he got a thrill that we got to play with his army blankets. Dad also built us a tree house in a tree that's still standing in our yard today. Dwayne was too little to be allowed in the tree house without parental guidance. Once the tree house was completed, Evan and I asked Mom and Dad if we could sleep, take our sleeping bags up there and sleep in the tree house overnight. They agreed that it would be okay. Well, you know, there are very strange sounds at night outside in the dark. We laid there for a long time wondering what each sound was and if it was scary enough to abandon our thrill of sleeping in the treehouse. Evan will probably differ with me, but I think he was just as scared as I was. And we climbed down the ladder and ran into the house and slept in our own beds. As I got older, Dad was my confidant. I could talk with him about anything, and he would listen carefully and then give me advice. I love that so much about my dad. And I cherish that one-on-one -on -one time with him. In college, I overspent my allowance by making long-distance phone calls to a man with whom I was deeply in love. Needless to say, that didn't go over well with mom and dad. So I had to go without an allowance until the bill had been paid. However, unbeknownst to my mom, my dad would slip me a five or $10 bill. He had my back. And then the memory of my dad walking me down the aisle here in this church is a special memory. My hand was shaking like this and my bouquet was rattling everywhere. And he grabbed my arm close to his and he said, it's gonna be okay. And it was, and I've been happily married to Chuck now for 36 years. One of the best things that my parents did for us kids was to send us to Little Creek Academy, which is in Knoxville, Tennessee. The work study program was amazing. We learned so many different skills and skills that we still use today. For me, it was typing. My parents could only afford a Smith Corona black heavy lead typewriter with the letters blocked out, but the numbers and the punctuation marks were there on the right keys. So we had to learn how to type from looking at the chart and learning how to touch type. And for that, I am so grateful because I'm a very proficient executive assistant today. And I thank my dad and my mom for finding Little Creek. Another skill I learned was working in the nursing home at Little Creek. And I learned how to lift and turn and do all the things needed for patients who couldn't care for themselves. And I so enjoyed doing that. So it was my joy and honor 
to come help Daryl take care of Dad at home during his last two weeks with us. My little creek head checked into action. I was like I had never lost a step in using my skills as a nursing aide. My dad truly loved Daryl. He picked a real chim to be his second wife. Daryl, thank you for being such a wonderful wife to my daddy. Your love and affection for him truly showed throughout the 20 years you were married. You are a real saint and a chim beyond compare. And I love you very much. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Bowman Hills Church, our church family, and our many friends that have come to celebrate my dad's life today. For your love and outpouring of affection, I don't know where we would be. We love each and every one of you very much. And I thank you so much for your support for our family during this time. My father was a very special man. And I'm so glad I could call him my daddy. Evan, you reminded my wife of something she whispered to me. Dad and Daryl were born, or not born, but married in 1999. In October, Nancy and I were married uh, in June of that same year. And we had the privilege of double dating. <laughs> my wife said, it was kind of strange to double date with my future in-laws. <laughs> Well, we had a lot of we had some good times and a lot of fun. On March 4, 2001, we uh, was Dad's 70th birthday. It was the Sabbath, and that morning I realized that I had failed to buy a birthday card for my dad. I was berating myself for this oversight all the way here to church. The Lord inspired my loving wife, Nancy, to suggest to me that Dad would appreciate something written myself, that I had written myself, rather than some sappy sentimental card from the store. She also pointed out that it was far better to express my love for him while he was alive and I could, and could appreciate it, rather than wait until he died and, went, and he couldn't. But what could I write for my dad? How could I write in just a few words the lifetime of love and gratitude to God I wanted to express to my dad? What title could I give such a brief few lines of verse? At the time of the Garden of Prayer at the service here, I came forward right here and laid these questions before God and pled for his help. Almost immediately, the still, God's still small voice started to speak to me. Why not my dad for a title? The voice said, 
After all, I gave Richard Chesney to be your dad as my gift to you and Evan and Sharon to help you see how much I love all of you. That title would be very appropriate. After the prayer, I returned to my seat near the back of this side of the church. I was almost all the way back to where almost the McClellans were. Or, and on the back of the blank side of a bulletin insert, I wrote the title, My Dad. Then the thoughts and basic structure began to come to me almost faster than I could write them down. When I got home from church, I went to my computer to polish and type out my notes that I'd written on the back of that long forgotten bulletin announcement. That evening at his birthday party, I read what I had written. And Nancy was right. Dad did appreciate what I had written more than a card from the store. That next week, I reformatted the poem and printed it out on fancier paper and in fancier type and gave it to Dad. He had it framed. This is it right here. And it has hung on his office wall ever since. Amen. So today, to honor his memory, I would like to share with you what I wrote 19 years ago for my dad. When I, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be with my dad. On Sunday mornings, I would ask, Mom, where's Dad? <laughs> when he would mow the lawn, I could hardly wait for him to finish mowing around the edges, Sharon Brooke, because I wanted to ride with my dad. When he worked on the car, I was content to hold the light and hand him tools because I was helping <laughs> my dad. When my pants needed dusting, I cried, not because the dusting hurt, but because I knew I had disappointed my dad. Now that I'm a man, when I need sound advice, I call my dad. When I need an example of how to love my wife, I look to my dad. And when I think, of the unfailing love God has for me, then I think that his love must be like the love of my dad. Just before Richard passed away, I got a call from a friend and church member who let me know that it probably wouldn't be very much longer uh, that, that Richard would be with us. And so I contacted Daryl and I, I made arrangements to come by the house and, and, and pray with, with Richard. And I sat there with him and we read some, I read some psalms to him and some verses with him. And, and then we had a special prayer there with Richard. Uh, less than 24 hours later, Richard went to sleep in the promise of his risen Savior. And so that, above all, is what we want to hold on to today. And one of the verses that I, I shared with Richard was 1 Thessalonians 4.13, where it says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, it doesn't say that we don't grieve. It says, you know, because grieving is natural. Grieving is good. Grieving is a gift. Um, a few days ago, Daryl gave me a, a book that had been a blessing to her and, and just shared that with me. And it, it says this. It says, grief looks back, hope looks forward, and mourning is the present experience of both grief and hope. 
Uh, Matthew 5, 4, the Bible, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they're the ones who are comforted. Even Jesus wept. The Son of God mourned. How much more do we need to mourn? Grieving is looking back. It's remembering, and that's what we've been blessed to do today. That's what we've heard, these tributes, these memories. Uh, What can we learn from Richard's life, his generosity, his kindness, his service to his country, his dedication to God. Um, I was blessed to be able to get to know Richard and blessed by him being here, Daryl and him, uh, the year and a half that I've been able to be here. And I knew that I would see Richard and Daryl. They were committed to being here, even when it wasn't easy for Richard to be able to come to church. He was in church. Uh, That's the type of dedication the church needs today. So grieving is looking back with longing. So someone with whom we love is missing. Someone who was here is no longer here. And so the empty seat at the dinner table and the lonely nights with the conversations that we used to have, we miss. The missing person that used to sit in that spot, in that pew, There are painful reminders that things don't last forever in this world, but we have hope. Grief looks back, but hope looks forward, and mourning is the present experience of both grief and hope. We do not grieve like those who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And then Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, the people that Paul was speaking to didn't have a whole lot to be encouraged about. The first century church had it rough. We think it's rough being asked to wear a a mask and not being able to come to the church. First century church had to worry their lives were on the line on a daily basis. Many of them would lose homes, they would lose jobs, they would lose lives because of their faith. And the only thing they had to hold on to that they could not lose was their hope. And in Hebrews 11, Paul really drives this home. The people in Hebrews also went through some very difficult times. And we have Hebrews 11 was this famous faith chapter. We have all these examples of people who overcame incredible odds. Verse 33 says, stop the mouths of lions. Verse 34 says, their faith quenched the power of fire. Verse 35 says, women received their dead by resurrection. But if our understanding of hope stops there, we're gonna be in trouble. If all we believe of our hope, if your idea of hope is, God will never let anything too bad happen to me, that God will always step in and shut the lion's mouths, that God will always step in, if that's your understanding of hope, then you're in trouble. You need a better hope than that. Uh, Richard had a deeper hope than that. And the good news of Hebrews 11 is that it does not stop at the beginning of verse 35, it continues on to what we need in order to make it in this life. Uh, We need something deeper. We need a better hope. It begins with this one word, others. Yes, there were those who escaped trials, but there were others who had trials of mournings and scourgings and bonds who were imprisoned. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. There are others that believe, others who had faith. There were others who trusted in God, and yet God, for whatever reason, did not intervene. In Acts 12, Peter is in prison. He's shackled. He's got two guards sleeping on both sides of him. But because the church prays earnestly, because of their faith and hope, an angel shows up and frees them. It's a miracle. 
Who wouldn't want that to happen to them? But there are others. There are people like Stephen, who preached one sermon, and then his life was taken. Uh, Who wasn't delivered from death, but his faith and hope took him to death. You have people like King David. He was the runt of the litter. Uh, He was a shepherd, and yet because of his faith and hope, hope, he, he goes from rags to riches. He conquers giants. He becomes king. But then you have others like Jonathan who had just as much faith and hope as David did, maybe even more, and yet he lost everything and died in a battle far from home. David trusted God and everything seemed to work out. Jonathan trusted in God and nothing seemed to work out. The widows in the Old Testament received their children back, but there are others, mothers down through the ages, who did not get their children back. Yet they stay the course. They remain faithful. Why? Hebrews 11.35 tells us they had a faith and hope in a better resurrection. This is what Paul is saying to the, the Thessalonican Christians. The world can't touch your hope if you have put it in something better than the world. As great as the widows, uh, it, as it was to get the, widow, uh, the widow's sons back, as wonderful as, as it was to get Lazarus back, as wonderful as it was for Jairus to get his daughter back, as wonderful as those miracles were, they were only resuscitations. Uh, they were still, death was only postponed. You see, our hope has to be in something better than resuscitation. We have to have hope in a better resurrection. In Revelation, it says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The better resurrection, we don't just get our family back. We don't just get our life back. We get it back, and we get it back better. We get the body back, but without the arthritis, better. We get the mind back, but without the Alzheimer's, better. We get our parents back, this time without the cancer, better. We get our kids back, but this time without the depression, better. Romans 6, 8 says, since we died with Christ, we know that we will live with Christ. Richard went to sleep with Christ, so he is coming alive with Christ. A better resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, whoa, we have more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. That's a better resurrection. The resurrection, the better resurrection, it's better than any big bank balance. It is better than any big house or, 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 or fast car. It is better than anything you can ever imagine. And on the day we experience that better resurrection, it's not just going to console us. Paul says it's going to swallow us whole. He says, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. One day soon, friends, all the pain and the loss of this life will instantly be swallowed up with the joy of seeing Jesus and those that we love at the better resurrection. You know, I have found it interesting that Jesus does not give Mary and Martha consolation, what we often do. You know, that's the only thing we can do. But Jesus can do something better. He doesn't offer Martha and Mary consolation because consolations don't really cut it when you lose someone you love. So Jesus gives them something better. Uh, Today, I want to share with you something better, Daryl. I want to share something better, Sharon. I want to share something with you that is better, Evan and Dwayne. I want to share with you what Jesus shared with Martha and Mary, a better resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Testing. Ta-
manifesting. See the prophecies fulfilling. Signs of the times, they're happening everywhere. Yes, I can almost hear the trumpet as he says, Go get your children. Midnight cry when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the First of all, I would like to repeat my thanks for all of you being here for our families, either in person or those of you who are watching online today. There have been many stories and memories already told, but I'm just going to add a few of my own. As many of you know, music has been a major part of my life since I was a little girl. Early in our relationship, I had no idea of Richard's personal background. One evening, he came over to my house to take me out on a date. When he arrived that evening, I wasn't quite ready, so I asked him if he would wait a few minutes. A minute or two later, I heard this lovely piano music coming from the other room. I first thought that Richard had turned on the stereo, but I came out and looked, and he was playing Claire de Lune on the piano. It was gorgeous. I had no idea Richard could play the piano and so beautifully. Needless to say, that endured me to him and gave me another reason to get to know him better. Of course, I soon found out how musical all his kids were and still are. Almost a year later, during our wedding reception, and some of you who were there will remember this, he admitted laughingly that he had married me because I had a pickup truck. <laughs> and I quipped back that I married him because he had a John Deere riding lawnmower. We had many chuckles over that after that, thinking about it. For most of our marriage, Richard had this 
constant allergy to something I could never quite figure out. He didn't want to go to an allergist. But I finally figured out it must be something here on, in our environment because whenever we went on vacation, he never had the runny nose problem. He was fine. Well, I teased him not very long ago, and it's been very recently. I teased him long, uh, uh, recently. I said, you know, maybe it's the cat. He never responded, so I didn't think anything more about it. And then re just recently, I mentioned to his daughter, Sharon, and she said, oh, well, you know, Dad is allergic to cats. All these years, he never said anything to me about being allergic to cats because he knew how much my cat meant to me. I didn't have a chance to tell him and, and have the opportunity to tell him how much his unselfishness meant to me. That's just the kind of person he was. I'll always be grateful for that because it could have been a deal breaker. <laughs> I will conclude with this one last memory. At the end of the day, Richard and I had a devotional time together, finishing each time with the same song every evening, and we sang it together. And by the way, if I pitched it a little bit out of our range, he could always find the right pitch, and we would start over. Even as he gradually lost the ability to talk, he could sing most of the words with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his words. Please stand. After the prayer, please remain standing as the family and the pastors exit. After they exit, you can be seated again, and one of our ushers, he's going to be dismissing by row, so you can sit back down and wait till you are dismissed. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we thank you, we praise you for all that you have done and all that you are doing in the world. We thank you for the gift uh, of Richard, the gift he was to his children, to his wife, to this church, to his community, to his profession. Lord, I just pray that as his hope was in you, that we will also put our hope in you today. Lord, I pray that you would be close to the family Surround them with your love, your assurance, and your peace that passes all understanding. We thank you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name, amen.